Welcome to the channel folks, my name's Shane. In today's video, I'm gonna share with you a free video shooters tutorial for the Panasonic S5 Mark II. This is an extremely powerful full frame camera from Panasonic that now has phase detection autofocus. Yes, finally. But if you own the original S5 like I do, I paid for four of these, they're great cameras. There's a lot of common ground between these. So consider this a tutorial for the original S5 as well. The Panasonic S5 Mark II also has some additional upgrades and benefits. We don't get any recording limits in the 4K modes, and we can also now shoot up to 6K at 30 frames per second. Over the last few weeks, I've stockpiled plenty of footage with this camera. If you missed my review, I'll link it up in the cards up here and you can check it out after this video. Odds are this video is going to be quite long, so I'll leave a table of contents down in the description below so you can skip ahead back or forth if you so choose to cover each of the sections that are important to you. Again, this will mostly focus on the video aspect of this particular camera from a content creator standpoint. Let's take a look at the physical body of the Panasonic S5 II. Now, just from the front, it looks almost identical to the original. From the side, it looks slightly different to the original. The new one is quite a little bit chunky and I'll explain why in just a moment. The grip is essentially the same size looking at it from the opposite direction and the back is identical. One of the reasons why the Panasonic S5 II is a little bit fatter is we now get a full size HDMI output on it as opposed to the micro one that we found on the Panasonic S5. Additionally, this camera also has a fan like the S1H or the GH6. So if you're looking to keep things cool while you shoot for long periods of time, this camera makes a whole lot of sense. I've never had any overheating issues with the original S5, but the new S5 II, thanks to that internal fan, has unlimited recording in most frame rates and modes. So if you wanna shoot 10 bit all day, you can do that and it won't overheat. Let's cover everything you need to know about the body, starting with the SD card door. So to click this open, just push it down and pull it towards you and it will flip up nicely. We get two SD card slots here, so you can set up redundancy if you wanna to record to two. The memory cards just go in with the sort of logo or design facing you. The top one is number one and the bottom one is number two. The great news is with the Panasonic S5 II, you don't need to go ahead and buy super expensive CF Express type B cards or anything like that. SD cards will do the job. I'll leave some recommendations down in the description if you wanna check out the ones that I use. Like basically all Panasonic cameras, we get this really great flip out screen. It can be used in selfie position if you wanna vlog or do anything where you're facing the camera. This is a really great thing for content creators. And being now that we get that face detection autofocus, I can see this being used out in the field as a primary camera. It really takes the complication out of wondering if everything's going to be in focus, but you get the reassurance there thanks to the flippy screen. We get an electronic viewfinder here, so if you wanna shoot video or photos with this, you can do that. You can also play back the files and look at it through here, just in case you can't, for whatever reason, see the LCD screen as bright as this is. I don't think it'll ever be a problem. We also get a diopter here as well, so if you wanna sort of change the focus point of the electronic viewfinder, you can move this around and it will adjust it accordingly. This basically means that if you have different eyesight or you wear glasses, you can adjust how it looks to your eye. So play around with the diopter on the side here if you have an issue with it straight out of the box. To insert a battery, all you need to do is push down on this door, it will pop open. We get a BLK22 battery like the original S5. These have a higher capacity than the original ones that you would find on the Panasonic GH5, for example. So this is great. The battery just goes in this way. Third time lucky, right? Like the USB port, so you can click that in. I'm doing everything backwards here, so it's a little bit more complicated to see what I'm doing. But basically, that's it. It clicks into place nicely. If you plan on using the S5 II in a studio situation like this, the great news is you can still use your dummy battery from the S5. It has no problems working in the S5 II. To attach your lens, it's nice and simple. Push in this release button here, turn this counterclockwise or anti-clockwise, and it will pop off. Do the same with this. Now you can see that there's some red dots on the lenses and also on the camera body, the red dot is located over here. We align the red dots like this and then we turn it this way, done. Once you hear the lens click into place, you're good to go and it won't come loose. Our on off button is over here. We get a nice big red record button for shooting video. Our shutter button is over here and it feels really nice in the hand. You can also start recording with this if you're in video mode. We get all the same buttons across here that we see on the Panasonic S5, including white balance, ISO, and exposure compensation. I'll talk about these in more detail in a moment. 
I love the placement of the two main dials. These help you get through different options on the camera. This is our thumb wheel. We also get one right near the shutter. Let's take a look at the command dial. So this mode that it's on right now, pointing towards this white dot is our movie mode. We then have our S and Q mode. So if you want to shoot in slow motion, for example, that's the mode you'll use. We get three custom modes built into the dial an intelligent auto photo mode, program mode, which is basically a similar kind of thing. It camera takes care of everything for you. We get aperture priority mode. So if you just want to shoot with a blurry background and take a photo, that's the mode to use. We also get shutter priority as well, which is a really great mode if you want to get some sort of motion blur in your footage or photo. And then we get over to M, which is complete manual mode. If you're just getting started, start with either aperture priority mode or intelligent auto, and you'll get some pretty great photographic results. The beauty of the custom modes is it allows you to store your favorite presets. So for example, I could be shooting in 4K 25p and store something like 4K 50p or 1080p at 50, whatever the case may be, within one of the custom settings, and I can recall it just by switching over. It's pretty wild. This dial over here controls all of our photographic modes. So for example, if you just want to take a single shot, use that mode. There's two burst rate modes as well, which is pretty cool. So if you want to shoot a whole lot of photos just by holding down the shutter, you can do that. This mode over here is one of the new upgrades over the S5. The high resolution mode takes a series of eight images in quick succession and then compiles them in camera. The S5 Mark II does this by moving the image sensor slightly between each shot to bump up the resolution and detail. Each of the high resolution photos only takes a few moments to process in camera and they don't need to be stitched together in editing after the fact as you'd find on other competitors camera systems. These last two options are time lapse and timer. So the beauty of time lapse is if you want to shoot at night, you can capture the sky for example. I'm not much of an astrophotographer, but that's the kind of mode that they'll use. The other mode is simply if you just want to set up a timer and jump into the shot, you can have that option as well. So it's great. They've included everything for both video and photo. The back of the camera has all of the same features we find on the S5. We get a wheel here that allows us not only to cycle through menu options, but we can push up, down, left and right on here as well. It actually has a clicking feel to it. These wheels are some of the best in the business. It also feels to me like the joystick has more tension on it. When I first got my original S5, I wasn't a huge fan of this joystick, but it actually feels pretty good under the thumb. This also is a way that we can control what we see in the menu system, or if we want to set up an autofocus point, we can either tap on screen here or use the joystick. We get an AF on button, which confirms focus for us, both in manual mode and if we're shooting in autofocus, you can hit this. It will then lock focus to that particular point. If you don't like using that AF button on the back, you can also still half press the shutter. It will confirm focus that way. We get an SC and MF switch over here, and this is thanks to this little lever control. That's manual focus. We get continuous autofocus and single point autofocus. One of the huge benefits that Panasonic have had for a long time is the manual focus experience. I'm shooting in manual focus on my GH5S right now because I know it's not going to do anything funny. This camera now also supports great autofocus in continuous autofocus mode. So it's up to you which mode you want to use, but now they've got that great autofocus paired with all of the manual tools you've come to know and expect from Panasonic. I think this is in a class of its own. If you push this back button over here, it'll take you into the autofocus modes on the camera. We get our play button over here so we can see what we've filmed or taken photos of just by viewing the LCD screen or the electronic viewfinder. This LVF button over here allows us to turn the viewfinder on or off. There's also a sensor over here. So if you run your hand or if you've got your eye up to it, the screen will turn off. If you want them both on at the same time, you can cycle through this mode just by hitting the LVF button a few times. If you plan on using this on a tripod, we get our threading on the bottom. It's centered as well, which is always a good thing right out of the way of the battery door. And we also get our terminals, which is something that got removed on the GH6. So it's great to see that this is still the same as the original S5 when it comes to everything underneath. Good move. This side of the camera has our audio options. So we get our microphone input at the top and our headphone output. It's great having a headphone output built into a camera. So if you're behind the camera shooting someone else, you can make sure the audio is recording. It's just one of those invaluable features, especially if you're doing a lot of filmmaking. This lower section over here houses the full size HDMI and the USB-C port. This, in my opinion, is one of the standout features over the original S5. Full size is just so much better. You don't need dongles or anything to get it out to a monitor or switcher like what I'm doing right now. 
I'm just gonna throw this in. After testing this camera extensively, this might be one of the best content creation tools out there. So if you're thinking about getting started and you need good autofocus, you want a full frame camera to give you lots of that background separation and low light performance, this is an absolute no brainer. We get a custom function button on the front. You can map this to whatever you like and I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. The great thing about this camera is it's completely customizable. So if you don't need exposure compensation, you can just hold it down and map it to your audio settings, for example. This is a really great feature and I'll run you through how to do that in just a moment. Let's take a look at the menu system built into the Panasonic S5 Mark II. I'm also gonna show you some of the settings that I changed for my style of shooting and when you can work out whether or not you wanna change it for your style as well. But I'll give you all of the basics again. I'll list all of this down in the description. On the back of the camera here, we have our menu set button. This allows us access to the main menu within the camera. The video icon on the top left is the one that we're taking a look at to begin with. And these are all the sub menu options over here. Now don't get too scared by this. There's a lot of information in here, but again, this will be the most sort of functional stuff to get you started. To get into a sub menu from here, all we need to do is tap on the menu set button. It will bring us into the things that we can change for that particular option. So I'm in aperture priority mode. We can change it to program, shutter priority, or full manual mode. Under exposure mode, we have our photo styles. Within this, we have all of our different color profiles that we can choose to shoot video in. Some are black and white, some are color, some are more saturated or desaturated, and V-Log is the one that a lot of professionals will choose. V-Log gives us the full dynamic range of the Panasonic S5 sensor, allowing us to get a really beautiful image that we can color grade however we like. In addition to V-Log, if we go right one more, we see the real-time LUT option. This allows you to bake in a LUT over V-Log while shooting a video to save you all of the post-processing. If you're just getting started, that might be a little bit too advanced, but that's how you find it. It's a really cool option. If you're just getting started, try the natural or flat picture profiles. The flat gives you a little bit more creative freedom. The natural will give you really great results straight out of camera. And a lot of people seem to like Cine D and Cine V. They're all great depending on your particular shooting scenario. So give them all a shot and see what works best for you. Let's take a look at these metering modes. This is how the camera exposes the scene. If we get into this option over here, we get four different options. Now by default, you'll be set to the top one. Now you might be saying, hey, what do these icons mean? If you're not sure about anything in the camera system, hit the display button and it'll bring up the text on screen. If you don't wanna see it again, you can hit it again and it will disappear. But this first one measures everything automatically on screen. So say for example, I had it in this mode, it would probably try to adjust everything so it doesn't clip anywhere. This mode will work for most situations, but not all situations. If you're in a studio, you'll be odds are you'll be running the camera manually anyway, but if you wanna run it in aperture priority mode, just leave it set to that. It should give you some pretty good results. If we go down to this one, which is my favorite option, it says measures the subject in the spot metering target. This particular mode allows you to move the spot metering anywhere on screen. So if you want to expose for a particular section or skin or whatever the case may be, you can do that just by using this mode. As you can see on screen, we have a plus in the middle of our autofocus target area. So I can move this wherever I like. Now, if I move it over my LED light up there, you're going to see that the whole exposure will come down because it's trying to expose for that light. If I move it over my GH5S camera here, it's gonna bring the exposure up. So this is a really handy tool for really nailing exposure in different situations. So for a studio situation, this is the mode that I recommend. Odds are if you've been on YouTube over the last few years, you've watched tutorials on certain electronics that may have lights already built into them and you see a lot of flickering and pulsing. That's where SynchroScan comes in. This essentially allows you to turn this feature on and adjust the shutter speed. So if I was shooting this, for example, and the shutter speed didn't match, but it does because it's not flickering or doing anything weird, we can adjust this just a couple of degrees left or right, and it will help combat that flickering. So if I was to really wind this to the left here, you'll see that it's pulsing. You see this in a lot of videos. If you bring it all the way up to you know, 180, it's going to be fine because we already proved that. Or it looks like it could be flickering slightly, so maybe we can just offset this a little bit. And that looks like it might already be better. So this is a really powerful feature if you plan on shooting anything with built-in lights or even an LCD screen. Anytime I get a Lumix camera, the first thing I do is change it to shutter angle over shutter speed. And I'll show you how to do that right now. I already have the camera in this particular mode, but I'll show you where it is just in case you want to change it. So if you go down to SS gain operation, this is page two. It says image quality two at the top. That's where it is. If you go into this option, change it to angle ISO. If we take a look on screen, you can see that it says 180 degrees down in the bottom right-hand corner. 
Changing the camera to 180 degree shutter allows the camera to pick the precise shutter speed for any shooting scenario. So if you're in 24, 25, 30, 50, 60, or 120 frames per second, the camera will adjust it accordingly, having the camera set at 180 degrees. If we keep scrolling down to the next page here, you can see we get record file format. I'll show you this on screen. So we get two to choose from, MOV and MP4. Just leave it set to MOV. This will give you the most options on the camera. We then get image area of video. Now this isn't available in every mode, but we get full APS-C and pixel to pixel. Full is the full sensor, the full frame sensor. APS-C mode gives us a 1.5 times crop and pixel to pixel gives us a slightly more zoomed in image than APS-C. I don't know if it's quite micro full thirds, but it's somewhere there, but you still get full recording quality. It's pretty wild how this works. Just know you will have to adjust your framing if you do change these modes. Up next, I'm gonna show you all the different resolutions and aspect ratios built into the Panasonic S5. So if we take a look on screen here, under recording quality, you can see we're set to full HD at 50p, which is one of the lower settings on the camera. We'll start from the bottom and work our way up. Just to the left of the yellow bar that's highlighted, you can see all of the information for that particular setting. So while we're in full HD 25p, you can see that it says full frame. So we're using the full frame sensor at 1920 by 1080. So that's the resolution, 16 by nine aspect ratio at 25 frames per second, 420 10-bit long op. So that's basically the recording type that it's using at 100 megabits per second. It also tells us that S and Q or slow and quick is also available as HLG. Now, if we go up, you'll see some of these change and some options will be missing. Now, we're, you can see this goes up to 422 10 bit. So this is giving us a little bit more color information to shoot with. But 420 is great. It's 10 bit footage that you can edit very easily. So I shoot in that a lot. If we go up here, you can see that we get into our 50p options and full HD at 100p. I'm in the PAL region, so I'm seeing 25, 50, and 100 frames per second. If you're in North America or somewhere that uses NTSC, you'll see 30, 60, and 120 frames per second. One of the biggest advantages that this camera has over the old one is we now get a 100p option built directly into the menu with sound. So this is a massive upgrade over the old one. The original S5 didn't have this option. What this means is you'll be able to record with sound and slow it down in post. So shooting at 100 frames per second, you can then choose to either slow it down at 50% or 25% if you want four times slow motion. It's pretty powerful and it's a big upgrade over the original. Above this, we have the 422 version as well. We can keep going up here. We start to get into the 4K options. If you're a filmmaker, odds are you'll love the fact we get DCI or Cinema 4K built directly into the S5. This is something that a lot of my far more expensive cameras don't even have. Some of the new features on this camera is the new 3.3K mode, which might sound a bit strange if you're unfamiliar with this, but it's a four by three aspect ratio. If you plan on shooting any sort of anamorphic and you don't wanna shoot in the maximum resolution, you have this at your disposal. It's also a really great format if you plan on shooting any vertical video, you can crop in on that later. Above the 3.3K, we get our 5.9K at 25 frames per second or 30 if you're in the NTSC zone. And this allows you to use the full frame sensor and shoot in 16 by nine. So if you want the highest resolution 16 by nine without having to do any type of cropping, that's the standard widescreen that you're looking at right now, that's the mode to use. We also get a 6K 25P with a 17 by nine aspect ratio. This mode is like DCI 4K, but with more resolution. At the top here, we get 6K 25P 10 bit 420. This is the full frame three by two aspect ratio. This open gate mode is by far the best mode I've ever seen out of any of the Panasonic cameras. It looks absolutely stunning, paired with the image quality and all of the great stuff you get with a full frame sensor. This is really something special. It also allows you to crop in in 16 by nine, 17 by nine, or a vertical video. It's up to you how you choose to crop, but really makes cropping in much easier than starting with a 16 by nine timeline. So it's really cool, it's really powerful. I suggest giving it a shot if you want the best in resolution. You can do this in camera without needing an Atomos Ninja or anything else to pair with it. This is wild. Now, if we scroll down to the next page, we get over to our focus options. Let's talk about autofocus. So this camera straight out of the box will give you far better autofocus performance than anything that Panasonic has ever released. Period. It's not even close. If you've got an S5 or a GH6, this takes all of the autofocus capabilities to the next level. 
but I had to make one change that made it far, far better. And I'll do a dedicated video on this, but I'll just give you the quick overview. This will put it on par with the Sony a7S III if you just wanna let the camera do the work. It's awesome. You can see that I've got AF detection setting on. Turn this on 100% and change this to animal and human, or of course you can just change it to human if you don't want any animals in the scene. This mode allows the camera to use its AI tracking, which will put up a yellow box around whatever it thinks is the human and it gets it right. Yes, <laughs> finally. After testing this out for the last few weeks, turn these two settings on and the autofocus is every bit as good as the Sony for this particular mode. So if you just want the camera to do the work, put these two settings on. Just to reiterate, I have my AF detection settings on and the detection subject set to animal and human. Now, if we go down to the AF custom video settings, you can turn this on or off. This is how I've currently got it set. I've turned the speed down because it was just a little bit too fast and I have the AF sensitivity to plus one. The great news is whether you leave it set to zero or if you customize it the way I have, you can adjust how fast the camera will pull focus from one subject to the next. You can really slow it down for a more cinematic look or you can have it go super responsive and fast if you're doing some high action sports. I leave it set to minus two and plus one, but feel free to experiment around, see what works best for you. There's also some autofocus mode. So we can get to that by using this button on the back that I showed you earlier. If we tap that, you'll see this come up on screen. It's currently set to the one I use the most, this full area mode with human animal detect on. If you wanna turn that off, all you need to do is get to the back of the camera here and push up and it will turn that off and it'll just go into the standard mode without animal and human detection. So you can kind of experiment around with this, but the best modes for someone in the frame is with this on. It works far better than every other camera from Panasonic. If you've seen a lot of my other Panasonic autofocus videos, that's all you need to know about this particular camera. There are other modes, again, like the old ones where you can go into the zone and set up a zone. That actually works pretty well. If we get over to the One Area Plus, this was my favorite on a lot of their other cameras because it really worked well for contrast-based only autofocus. But now, I much prefer the full area. Set it to that, use my settings, and you'll get great results. I'd love to hear your feedback if you already own this camera on using those settings. Focus peaking is an essential tool anytime you're talking about manual focus, and I always have this set to on. We can go down to set here. We can change the sensitivity of the focus peaking and the display color. The display color is the thing that you'll need to change first up just to make sure that it works. And you can also change it via AFS, which is autofocus single point. Display during manual focus, it's on. So I'll show you an example of this right now. If we focus on the microphone here, you can see that it comes up in red. I'll bring this forward so you can see it a little bit more. This is in that 6K mode, <laughs> going through a 1080 switcher. So as you can see, focus peaking is now enabled. On this one area AF moving speed, I've currently got it set to fast. What this will do is change the speed of the box when you use the joystick if you're using it manually. But the interesting thing is, I'm not sure why this is even an option. You can just kind of move it with your finger like this as well if you do need a box point somewhere. But yeah, you can change this from fast to slow. Just leave it set to fast. If you find that you need it to slow down, change the setting then. But again, the camera does such a great job in autofocus mode, you don't really need it, or you can just simply move it on screen with your finger. So there you go. On the next page down, we get into all of our audio settings. Now, like all Panasonic cameras, this has a lot of audio options as well. We can choose to display the sound level meter on screen, which is always a thing you should turn on 100% of the time. Always leave that on. You'll see the little green bars sort of moving up and down. Now, if we go down to sound record gain level, I've currently got it set to low. We can set it to standard. This gives us two different input volumes we can work with. So if you're using a really hot shotgun microphone, a wireless pack, we can set it to low or leave it to standard. It's set to standard by default and that should work for most people. We can also change the record level adjustment just by either using this button on the back here, we can move it down to minus 18 at its lowest or mute it, and we can move it all the way up to plus 12 dB. So it gives you lots of flexibility. You can also just touch on screen as well, which is one of the great things about this particular touch screen. If we go down to sound record level limiter, I always leave this on. The reason is if you're using the onboard microphone, say you're at a gig, for example, the audio won't clip. The camera kind of automatically compensates for how much volume is going into it and it will adjust accordingly. Sort of within reason, right? You can't just have it next to a speaker at full blast. It's probably not gonna handle that. But if you're just sitting in a crowd, for example, you can sort of adjust the volume level and then that audio limiter really does help 
isolate it from sort of getting any nasty peaks above zero dB. Just under the sound record level limiter, we get mic socket. This allows us three different options. By default, it's set to this top one. It allows the microphone to work if power is supplied to an external mic by the camera. So this can power certain types of mics that do require a little bit of phantom power. If we go down here, or electric condensers, whichever way you wanna look at that, and this works as a mic input. Power is not supplied to an external mic by the camera. Again, you might as well just leave it set to the top one. And if you need a line level input, say going out of a mixer, for example, you also have that option. Again, this is just using that 3.5 millimeter input jack on the top of the camera. Now, if we scroll down, the rest of these audio options are pretty self-explanatory. The headphone volume is how loud the audio is on playback or in real time if you are using headphones in the camera. We also get the sound monitoring channel. We can set this to channel one and channel two, which is by default the 3.5 millimeter input that's on the side of the camera, or we can choose channel three and channel four or any combination of all. I'm using a Panasonic DMW XLR adapter on my primary camera here and a shotgun microphone is going directly into it. This gives us two additional XLR inputs to give you pro audio without having to do a whole lot of work or synchronization in post, it just works. So we get not only the ability to use that, but we can also use the 3.5 millimeter input at the same time and get four channels of audio. Four channels of audio might not be for everybody. And if you just so choose, you can use one XLR into the camera or you can use the 3.5 millimeter. It really gives you lots of options when recording audio. The last thing I want to show you here is the image stabilizer. But before I do that, I want to show you how I set up the camera. One of the first things I do anytime I get a Panasonic camera is I reassign this back button to the stabilizer. And I'll show you that right now. So if we hold this in for a couple of seconds, it will bring up this menu on screen. You can see that I've got it set to boost IS video. This is on the second option down on I think page four. You can assign this button to do any of these features within the camera at the touch of a button. So if you wanna assign your audio level recording option, you can assign it in this position as well. What this means is we get a couple of different stabilization modes and I'll showcase how this works right now. On the top right of the screen, you can see the body with the little hand on it. If I push this button again back here, it will change to a hand with a box around it. Now these are two separate modes for different things. The mode that's designated with the two lines beside it is for any type of handheld work. So if you're doing a follow shot, for example, if you're doing any type of vlogging, that's the mode that you wanna use. The boost mode has the box around it and that's designed to emulate a tripod. If you're wondering how the S5 Mark II compares up against the S5 in terms of stabilization, I did notice the difference with the new camera when it came to follow shots. But for IS boost mode, where you're just standing there with the camera in your hand, both of them will do a really great job. But if you do a lot of follow shots and run and gun style stuff, that's where the S5 Mark II has an advantage. Let's take a look at the second menu option from the AF over here. This also controls all of the manual focus settings on the camera. I'll bring it up on screen so you can get a sense of what's going on. So one of the things I like to change on here is this manual focus assist. By default, the focus ring is on and the manual focus assist display is set to picture in picture. I'll show you an example of that now. You have a couple of different options when you manually focus with the camera and what shows on the LCD display. When you start to turn the focus ring on the display, the first thing you'll see is this pop-up box show up on screen. You can move this to wherever you like. It's basically a magnification setting. I don't love using this. It's up to you if you like picture in picture, but for me, I can't stand this for most of this type of stuff that I shoot, but it's all personal choice. So if you wanna turn this off, what you do, you go into manual focus assist here. We go down to Focus ring, we turn this to off, and we also change this to full. And this will just give us the full display. Now, the reason I'm showing you the back of the camera is because this doesn't actually output over HDMI. So as I turn the focus ring on the lens now, you can see that we're not zooming in, there's no picture in picture, and everything is a lot clearer. If you plan on shooting in V-Log and you wanna use the View Assist tool, it's located right here. The ability of this is to load a lot into the camera or use this V-Log to 709 profile that allows us to view V-Log with a color grade applied. We can store up to 10 LUTs within the Panasonic S5 Mark II and we can preview that out over HDMI or we can record with a LUT applied to V-Log in camera. This is a first to my knowledge when it comes to the Panasonic system. Once you have a LUT installed via your SD card, you can simply set it using any of these 10 slots. If you want to preview the LUT on the built-in display on the camera, we can use this LUT view assist, or if it goes out over HDMI, we can turn this option on. 
Another one of the tools I always turn on is center marker. You might not need this, but I really like turning this on. It just allows you to frame your shot, especially if you're in a studio situation, you can hit dead center. If I show you the actual view now, you can see that there's a crosshair right in the center. Let's talk about framing markers. Say you're shooting in open gate and you wanna crop into a one by one aspect ratio, 16 by nine, or a cinema aspect ratio later on in post, you can do that by adding some markers. It's just a really great way of framing your shot. From framing marker here, we can turn this to on. We can also set the color and the aspect ratio that we wanna use as a guide. So 235 to one is a cinema aspect ratio. Let's start with that. If we go over to this screen right here, you'll see a blue box come up. And this is great. It allows you to really get a sense of what you'll have as an end result once you crop in on this aspect ratio. Let's say you're shooting for Instagram. We can change this to a one by one aspect ratio, which is most of the way down the bottom here. While we are cropping in on the sides, we're using the entirety of the sensor in the up position. This is the beauty of shooting in open gate and using these markers as a reference. Even though the box is in the middle for this particular view, in post you can crop to the left or right of the box. It's up to you how you want to use it. If you plan on using open gate and shooting for YouTube, just set the framing aspect ratio to 16 by 9 and you'll be in business. Two options under frame marker, we have WFM, which stands for waveform and vector scope. It's currently set to off, but I'm gonna show you an easier way of using these. On the front of the camera here, we have a custom function button. I always assign this to the waveform and vector scope. So to do this, just hold it down for about a second. And then this menu will pop up on screen and I'll bring it up on the main screen here so you can get a sense of what's going on. So there's so many different options in here. Well, I'm just gonna scroll down and show you a few different ones until we get to where we've got to get to. So if we keep going down, it's this option here. I wanna actually change it to waveform and vector scope. You can just pick one or the other or both and I'll show you what they do. If I just push the button in on the front that we just mapped, it will bring up the waveform. This is an exposure tool. So I can bring the exposure up. You'll see everything start to get pushed up to maximum. If I bring the exposure down or the ISO down, you're going to see that everything is now in a safe area. This is really cool. And the beauty of this is you might be saying, hey, why is it filling up the screen? You can simply resize it just by touching it and then using this wheel, you can also reposition it anywhere you like. These tools aren't found in a lot of cameras, but Panasonic have had them for years. It's a really great feature. Learn to use these. It's the best tool for setting exposure. If I tap that button again, it will bring up the vector scope, which is used for setting your skin tones. While these are somewhat advanced features, learning to use the waveform is absolutely invaluable. I encourage you to learn it. It's actually very, very easy to read once you know what to look for. Three options down from waveform and vector scopes. We go down to the red record frame indicator. Set this to on. The benefit of this particular tool is you get a nice big red frame around the edge of the LCD screen or the viewfinder letting you know that the camera is recording. Sometimes you think you're recording and you're not, and it's much easier to miss if the red recording indicator is off. So turn this on. I hope Panasonic turned this on by default. On the next page down, we have HDMI record output. It's currently set to on. The reason it's on is I want you to see the menu that's on screen, as well as all the information and borders and so forth that I've got on this particular camera. If I don't want that on, say I'm doing some live streaming and I don't wanna see all of that information, we can simply turn this to off and it will disappear for the program out to your live stream. The Panasonic S5 Mark II also has an internal fan to keep things cool. I'll show you how to change those parameters. If you go down to fan mode here, we have a few different options that we can change it to. Say you're in a really hot environment and you need the fan working continuously at the fastest speed, you can turn it to fast. I just leave it set to auto too, which is what it was on at default at the time of me getting the camera. It says the fan speed will be selected automatically depending on the camera's internal temperature. The fan will be disabled if not needed. So that will help save you a little bit of battery life. Now the top option here says the fan speed will only be selected automatically with the emphasis to cool down the camera body. I think auto two will probably be the best mode for most people. If you use one of the auto settings, the fan is extremely quiet. If you set it to fast, you will hear it. And in some shooting situations, that might not be ideal. If we go down one option from fan mode, it brings us into our lens and other options here. One of the best features, again, when it comes to manually focusing is turning on lens focus resume from off to on. If you love to shoot in manual focus like I do in a studio situation, I can come in, turn off my Panasonic cameras, come in the next day, hit record, and I'll be good to go. I don't have to adjust focus or do anything. It remembers the position. 
It's pretty wild. Two options down, we have focus ring control. You can see it's set to non-linear. We wanna turn this to linear. What this allows you to do is to focus manually, repeatably, and reliably. Now, a lot of lenses have the focus by wire system. This gives you a sense like you'd be using a manual focus lens. It's not quite as good as that, but you'll get a sense of being able to turn the lens a specific amount to go between infinity and macro. If we go into the set option, I really like changing this somewhere between 120 and 180 degrees. This means I don't have to turn the focus ring in its entirety to go from close focus to maximum focus. So you can set this according to your shooting scenario. I found with shooting products, for example, sometimes even 90 degrees is great, but this goes all the way down to 1080 which is multiple turns of the focus ring. And there's also a maximum option here as well. Let's take a look at our SD card options. I'm gonna show you how to format it and how to create a backup file if you need it. If we go into the menu set option here to the wrench and up to the top, you can see that we get card format. This could be used to format either of the two cards that are in the system. Card slot one, or card slot two, if there's something in the second card slot. We also get a double card slot function. The beauty of this is it allows us to change the recording method from a relay recording, which basically allows one card to get full and then it will go over to the next one, to backup recording. Say for example, you're going overseas or you're doing a paid gig, having a backup just in case a card fails is of the utmost importance. So definitely set this to backup recording, or we have a third option down here, which is called allocated recording. And this will put photos on one SD card and video on the other. Now allocation recording might be great for certain types of non-professional work. So if you just wanna help get things organized and you're not shooting all day, this mode might be beneficial for you, but I'm always partial to backup recording, especially if I'm doing something very important, or relay recording if I just wanna maximize my storage on the SD cards. Just down from double card slot function, we can see that we get two different options to adjust the frame rate of the monitor, which is the built-in monitor on the back, or the live viewfinder or the electronic viewfinder back here. So the monitor itself can be set to either 30 or 60 frames per second, and the LVF frame rate is currently set to 60, we can turn this to 120 frames per second. If you plan on shooting upwards of 100 frames per second, set the live viewfinder to 120p. It makes a huge difference when you're just monitoring the footage. If you wanna change the monitor settings, we also have those options in here. We can change the brightness, contrast, hue, and many other options in here. This screen is so good. When I've used it outdoors, even with sunglasses, I had no problem seeing it whatsoever. It's a massive upgrade over the screens on something like the Sony A7S III or the Sony FX3. Outdoors on a bright sunny day, I didn't even have to customize anything. It just looked great. Let's say we wanna turn on Wi-Fi to use the Lumix Sync app to control the camera remotely. We can do it one of two ways. We can either menu dive through here or we can set up a custom button. So to do this, what I like to do is hold left here until this menu shows up. And then I go up and I find the Wi-Fi mode and it's second from the bottom here or third or whatever that is. And then if I push left, the Wi-Fi is enabled on the camera. This is by far the easiest way to connect from your phone to the camera or iPad or anything that runs the Lumix Sync app. The great news is while I only map this left button, we still have the up, right, and down button that we can map as well. If you're in a situation where you own multiple Panasonic S5 Mark II cameras and you want them all set up the same, once you configure one, I'll show you how to do that or to recall those settings at a moment's notice. If we go to the wrench, to the cog wheel, over to save, restore, camera settings, it allows us to save a backup of the current camera configuration. This is really handy. You just do this by clicking OK through these options here, and then it will save the file. It takes only a couple of seconds. Now, if I've got another one of these cameras, I take that SD card out, put it in this camera. I can then go back into this save restore camera setting option and click load, and then it will find the actual file that we just saved. I can hit menu set. It will load the file and it will be exactly as I left it and saved it prior. This is why I always recommend people to get multiples of the same camera in a multi-camera environment. It really makes keeping all of the settings consistent very easy. If you don't need the settings that you just saved, you can find the delete option here and it will find the file. You can simply delete it just like that. Let's take a look at the custom settings mode because this is a really powerful feature. Say I shoot normally at 4K at 25 frames per second in 16 by nine, but there's times where I need to get a little bit of slow motion B-roll. So I might wanna store 
an APS-C crop at 50 or 60 frames per second, for example, the camera allows us to do that and to save it and recall it very easily. You can see here that it says save to custom mode. Now this might be my standard shooting scenario mode. So what I'm gonna do is just hit save to this and I'm gonna save it to C1. C1 is via this top dial position over here. So if I wanna save this to C1 now, all I have to do is hit the menu set button we can overwrite this if it's not already you know, saved to something else and we click yes and we're good to go. Now let's say for example, we wanna save an open gate setting or a super slow motion one, whatever the case may be, I'll show you how to do that now. The easiest way is just to go into here. I'm just gonna pick a random one. It doesn't really matter what it is. Let's choose a 50p one just for the sake of it. Cinema 4K at 50p. Then if we go in over to our wrench down the bottom here, we can save to custom mode. We save this to C2. Done. Going from the movie mode on the top over to C1 or C2, we'll recall both of those two modes that I just set up and saved. Just know this is completely separate to the S and Q mode, which I'll show you now. To set up S and Q on the Panasonic S5 Mark II, set it to the S and Q mode on this top dial. We can then set our S and Q speed via this record quality here. So what I'm gonna do, you can see that it says S and Q available. It's only S and Q available up to 50 frames per second in PAL. So what I wanna do is go down to this option right here, full HD 25P 420 10-bit. Now, if we select this, we can shoot up to 180 frames per second in camera, and this will be slowed down in camera. As I mentioned, this mode allows you to take the file out of the camera, throw it on your timeline, and you won't have to do anything to it. You don't get audio, but it's slowed down automatically. Now I have to tell you, 180 frames per second doesn't look great, and you don't get autofocus. You also don't get autofocus at 150 frames per second, but the video quality gets far better. I think the sweet spot with this is either 120 frames per second or 100 frames per second in full HD using the full width of the sensor. You can also assign this to just a 4K 50 or 60 frames per second mode if you so choose. So you can switch it over to that and get a two times slow motion effect. The only thing I wish this camera had was 4K at 100 and 120 frames per second, but we're not quite there yet. But as it stands, the slow motion out of this at either 100 or 120p looks pretty good to my eye. If you don't need to use all of the features and you just want to recall a handful, there's also a My Menu option. If we go into the Menu Set button on the back of the camera and down to the little person emoticon, we can then see that we've got no items on these three pages. Now, the good news is to add one, it's really simple. We can edit My Menu, we can hit Add. Let's go to Record File Format. Now, if I take a look to the number one option here, it says record file format and it's saved into this menu. This is a really easy way of just adding the things you use the most to a custom menu. Much like the original Panasonic S5, the S5 Mark II allows you to change regions from PAL to NTSC at the touch of a button. If we go over to the wrench icon, down to the bottom wrench icon, you can see that it's set to the system frequency of 50 Hertz in the PAL region. If I tap on this, we get 59.94 Hertz, which is NTSC, and we get True 24 Hertz Cinema. True 24 Hertz wasn't available on the original S5, so it's a great inclusion in the S5 Mark II. This might be an absolute deal maker for people who love shooting in True 24 Hertz. Scrolling down from system frequency, we can check our firmware using the firmware version. Odds are if you've just bought this camera, there's probably a firmware update already or one coming up. That's the great thing about these cameras, they continually get updated. I'll link down in the description box below so you can check out to see which firmware is available at the time of your viewing. 